Hey, uh, grab your Bible, turn to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12, 2 Samuel 12. We're going to wrap up our series in David today. Do not miss next week. Uh, I'm doing a one week, just standalone message called, titled the message is Not on Our Watch. Everyone say that. In other words, how many know that, that basically a lot of uh, politicians, a lot of teachers, a lot of coaches, a lot of parents have given up on this generation? Not on our watch. Not on our watch. We, how many know that Jesus said, let the, let the kids come to me? Jesus, uh, the Bible says that God is going to restore the hearts of the father back to the kids and the kids to the father. And I don't know about you, we are going to fight for this generation. We are not going to lose them. They are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. We're going to hear some amazing testimonies from some young people, what God's doing in their life and why, why, they, why they come on Wednesday nights, why they come on Sunday morning, and it's going to be a great time together. So don't turn to somebody and say, don't miss it, man. Don't miss it. Do not miss it. I said turn to somebody. You're not turning to somebody. You're looking at me. <laughs> Do not miss it next week. And then in a couple of weeks, uh, 21st birthday party. It's going to be amazing. Can't wait to have Charles Walker and his wife back out. Friday night concert will be great. And then Sunday morning, we are going to rock and roll for Jesus It's going to be a blast. So hope, hopefully you're going to be there. By the way, I need to say this. It's really a, a important for all of us uh, to come to church every Sunday, lest you're out of town or sick. And uh, it, I think it's important to invite people, but we don't say this enough that you just, you need, I need to be here every week. Because if I don't come every week, I don't know about you, you're probably a lot more spiritual than I am. But if I miss church a couple weeks, I just get like a bad attitude. I get short with my kids. Uh, people get on my nerves. I just drive in traffic with an attitude. And, and I start doing what Peter did. I, I start following Jesus at a distance. And so sometimes I just got to be honest. Look at me. Sometimes I don't even want to be here. And that's terrible to say that because I'm the pastor. But sometimes I wake up, I'm like, man, I wish I could sleep in and come to just one service. And, but I, I come because I want to be in the presence of God. How many have ever come to church not wanting to come? And when you came, you're like, man, I'm so glad I went, right? Good. So the 13 of you that raised your hand, you're awesome. Just, and we just got to come every Sunday because God has a word for us. God has a word for us. And he's got one today as well. I was so awesome. Uh, last week, we had 3,022 people in our four services. And come on, put your hands together and celebrate that. I mean, you know, every person that comes is really important. Every person has a name. Every name has a story. Every story matters to God. And uh, that's cool, 3,022 people, uh, because we started with 40 people in a hotel, and we struggled, and you weren't there. You just show up with all the lights and stuff. Anyhow, uh, it's awesome to see what God's done. But uh, Here's what's more exciting is not just the numbers of people that are coming. I'm glad that our church is growing, but I'm more excited that people are growing. Yes. I'll just, I'm going to amen myself. Hold on. I'm excited that people are growing. Amen, Pastor C. That's good. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I love that, that I want to be closer to Jesus next week, next month, next year than I am today. Anybody have that same desire? Probably you wouldn't be here. And uh, so that's great. I love what God's doing in our church. I'm excited for the fall. We've been praying for revival. I believe that God's bringing a revival. As you look at the world events and all the chaos and what's going on in politics and the news and, and it's coming to pass. The Bible says that, that people are going to be lovers of themselves, disobedient to their parents, lack of respect, and that's taking place. So two things, either Jesus is coming back real soon or there's going to be massive revival in America. All the bars are going to close down, and uh, I'll tell you, God's going to show up in a powerful way, and I want, to be a, I want to be a part of that revival. Anybody else here? So let's keep praying for God to move, and that's awesome. I better shut up because I have to preach. 2 Samuel chapter 12, uh, as you're turning there or have turned there, uh, last week we left David in a very bad place. Uh, he committed adultery, he lied, he lusted, he was living a hypocritical life, he slept with Bathsheba, he killed uh, her husband Uriah. In fact, uh, chapter 11, verse 27, this is where we left la last week. The Bible says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, displeased the Lord. I want to ask you a question, how many of you messed up this week? messed up this week. Okay. Uh, you lost your temper. You thought about something that you sh shouldn't have thought about. You, you kind of went off on your kids or your spouse. Um, in fact, they're elbowing you right now and uh, you kind of messed up and we all, how many of we all messed up? The Bible says we all stumble in many ways. And, and I'm not talking about like, I lost my temper. I, I was late to work. I, I flipped somebody off on the freeway. I, 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 we shouldn't do that for sure. But I'm talking about like, how many of you in your lifetime have messed up like big time? I got my, I, people, 
people don't raise their hand until I do it. So I'll raise my hand. And, and it, see, you don't, you don't know most of the stories in the church because we have people in our church that have had abortions. I've, I've actually talked to people in our church, and I'm not going to tell you who they are because you wouldn't sit next to them. Uh, but they've actually, they've actually committed murder. Uh, we have people that have been addicted to drugs, have sold, they sell drugs, they were in gangs. I mean, you, you name it, I'm not surprised by anything anymore. We, and to different degrees, but some of us, some of us, we've, we've failed big time, miserably. And, and God, God doesn't really, he's not blown away, he's not surprised at our sin, right? Uh, but he does judge our sin. And the Bible says in Psalm 711, God is angry at the wicked every day. So sin is a big deal to God. As long as we handle it correctly and we confess it, I want to talk about that in just a second. But it is a big deal. He, he has an opinion. Uh, he, do, he doesn't just kind of wink and say, well, it doesn't really matter how you live. No, he, he's super concerned about, just like he was with David 3,000 years ago. He's the same God yesterday, today, and so the culture might change, but how I many of oh, God never changes? So he was upset about David's compromise 3,000 years ago. He's upset about the things that you and I compromise today. You're like, well, I don't think God's like that. It doesn't matter what you and I think. God wrote a book called The Word of God, and he has an opinion. He's already shared his opinion. Uh, and other, Linda's on the front row. Uh, Scott and Linda are awesome people on our staff. So I'll just ask you a series of questions. Don't be nervous. I'm not going to have you stand up. Um, what is your favorite movie of all time or one of them? Sound of music, okay. Why are you clapping? Um, I'm just kidding. Sound, sound of music, okay. And I'm going to say, no, it's not. It's Karate Kid. That's my opinion. Uh, fa- what's one of your favorite, like, cuisines? Why do you keep looking at your husband? Like, uh, let's, okay, seafood. I'm going to say, no, it's not. It's Italian. And favorite vegetable? Broccoli. That's ridiculous. It's not broccoli. It's beets. <laughs> Like, how stupid is that for me to tell her what her favorite, like, no, it's not, bro- don't ever say that again in church, it's, not, it's beats. And, and it's your favorite movie of all time was Texas Chainsaw, whatever, right? <laughs> no, she's like, I just told you my opinion, I told you what I like, and I'm like, no, how dumb is that to tell her what I think? And we do that with God. I don't think God cares that I smoke weed because he created it. That's stupid. I don't know the Greek word for it, but it's stupid. God doesn't care if I sleep around with people because I, I got a lot of testosterone. You might, you might think that, but God, God says some things about promiscuity. God says some things about premarital sex. Well, I don't, I don't, that's like the God of the Old Testament. No, same God yesterday, today, and forever. Well, I think God's like, doesn't matter what you think. Like, if I was in the lobby after the service and we had the privilege to meet for the first time and you went home and you're like, I finally got to meet him. Every time he preaches, he goes backstage. And why? Well, because I got to preach four times and I'm tired. But anyhow, well, we met you and, and you got home and you're like, I finally met the pastor. Well, what does he look like? He's six foot ten African American. <laughs> you're like, oh, really? Because I've seen like the live stream. He doesn't look that tall and he's definitely not African American. No, he is. See, it doesn't matter if you think I'm Filipino or Latino or what. It does, doesn't matter your opinion. I am who I am. And God is who he is. You can't say, well, I think God's like this. And I don't think God cares if I cheat on my spouse. No, he's already said what he's for and what he's against. That the same God that was upset at David's compromise and sin 3,000 years ago. Come on, I'm preaching already. Is the same God that is upset about our sin today. So the question is, how will, how will we handle the sin, because all of us will sin, true or false. We're all going to sin. Well, here's the three, uh, we, I shared three points with you last week. Here's three more today. Three things I want to talk about as we relate to David and as we wrap up the series. Number one, write this in your notes here. Point number one, the confrontation of David's sin. Someone say confrontation. The confrontation of David's sin. Are you ready to look at your Bible now? You're like, no, I'm writing down that word. Okay, now are you ready? Okay, the confrontation of David's sin, it's found in verses 1 through 12, but we're probably not going to read all of them. Check out verse 1. The Lord, okay, so the Lord, is the Lord going to be okay with David's sin? Is the Lord going to be okay with this compromise? Is, Is God okay with him cheating? Is God okay with him killing someone? No, the Lord, notice what the Lord does. He sent Nathan to David. Someone say sent, sent. Every time you and I live and choose to live a compromise a life of compromise and sin, look right into my eyes. Eventually, God will send someone to confront you. And typically, he sends people. People. He, 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 I'm, 
he could have showed up at the palace with David and just like sat across, had a little frappuccino with him and said, hey, David, we got some. No, no. David sent, uh, God sent David's best friend, Nathan. The Lord sends people. How many of you, God speaks through people 99% of the time. I have never, there has been people, but I have personally never heard an audible voice from God. And we hear people say that, oh, God spoke to me. God spoke. You got to be careful. They, you could say, I think God said this to me, but I'm not sure. Uh, but God spoke. But I've never heard an audible voice, but I've heard God speak to me through people. How I many of He'll speak to you through your wife, your boss, your pastor, parents? Look at me. He'll speak to you through your kids. They'll say something and, like, well, didn't Pastor Steve so, say so and so? You shouldn't be doing that. You're like, whoa. God sends people. I, I talked to a lady a couple months ago, and she's like, um, Pastor Steve, I need your advice on something. And so I said, well, I think you should do this. And she says, well, let me think about it. And I said, have you, have you talked to anybody else? She goes, yeah, I talked to a couple of other pastors and a small group leader. They said the same thing that you're saying. She goes, I'm going to go home and think about it. <laughs> you are 0 for 3. You have three godly people saying the same thing. God just told you what to do. So God's going to send Nathan to David to confront him in his sin. How many of you know that God sends people, the right people, at the right time to challenge you? And is anybody ever surprised sometimes about the timing of God? Because when I look at other people's sin, I'm like, get him, God. <laughs> Here's the question. Like, when did Nathan go to David? Was it after he had an affair with Bathsheba? No. Was it when she had the baby? No. Was it when Uriah was killed? No. Most scholars say it was one year after David's sin that finally God sent Nathan to him. And I'm thinking, you should have done it like the day after or a week later, a year. Why? Because God knows who to send and when to send them. So can I tell you a really cool story? Um, and it should get you to, to wake up a little bit. A, year, a couple of years ago, we were at convention, a four-square convention. We were in, I'm not going to tell you the, the city or the state, um, but we went to the convention. It was like a Tuesday night, and it ended at about 9.30 at night, and we all ate before the convention, but Pastor Ray and Maria didn't eat. So after the convention, by the, it was like 10 o'clock at night, and they were still hungry. So Pastor Ray and Maria go walking down the streets of Phoenix, kind of on the outskirts of Phoenix, and they just walked into a, a hotel there, and they walked in, and there was a restaurant there. They wanted to get something to eat. It was the only restaurant available. Chad, this is so awesome. So they walk into the hotel, and there's a guy in our church who's on a business meeting. You're like, what was he doing there? Not just like a beer, not just a glass of wine. He was hammered. So Pastor Ray looks at Maria and she goes, he said, how many, how many know Pastor Ray? He is so awesome. <laughs> and he's not afraid of anything. He goes, I'm going to go challenge that guy, get in his face. And she said, no, you're not. And he goes, yes, I am. So he went, he went right over there and said, you should not be doing that. What are you doing? And got in the guy's face and he's like, well, don't you have a glass of wine once in a while? He goes, no. And he's just like, I'm like, how awesome is that? Who would have thought this guy goes on a business trip? Hey, they've never been to this city, right? And who would have thought like on a Tuesday night at 1030 in a random hotel, God would have sent Pastor Ray. That is awesome. The right person at the right time to deal with your compromising life. I love the sovereignty of God. Come on, somebody make some noise in the play. The Lord sent Nathan to David. You know, there's a lot of people after I'll preach a message, they're like, Pastor, I got a question for you. You were preaching and I want to know, did my wife come to you? Did she call and say, say this when you get up there? Because you were, here's what they say, you were reading my mail. How many have ever heard a message you're like, they had to know something, right? No, no. The Holy Spirit knows something. I, I'm not, I'll, I'll talk about like the peace of God for 45 minutes and people come up and say, man, that was such an awesome message about heaven. I'm like, what? How was it? To, I talked about the peace of God, right? And you're going to have peace. But it, it just, it's what the Holy Spirit wanted you to hear. And here's what God wanted David to hear. You're living a life of compromise and sin. So he sends the right guy at the right time. Check this out, with the right message. If you're ever going to speak on behalf of God, you have to have the right attitude. You've got to say the right things. You've got to be both truthful and graceful. So check out this setup, this story. So Nathan marches into the palace, and he's going to have a conversation with David the king. I mean, no, that's a little scary. You're going into, like, the king, right? And so the Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said there were two men in a certain town. Here's the story, right? 
Nathan's going to share a story. There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had what? Nothing except one little lamb he had bought. He raised it and he grew up with it and his children. It shared his food and drink. I think that's a little weird. Some of you do that with your pets. Don't, would you leave your pet at home? Don't bring it to the supermarket. That's just weird. Anyhow, uh, he raised it and grew up with him and his children. It, sh no, it shared his food and drink from his cup and it even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. You tracking? So still in the story, Nathan's telling David the story. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Rich guy has a lot of stuff. Poor guy shows up and he has one lamb. And the rich guy, instead of taking one of his lambs to kill it and to feed the rich guy, what does he do? Instead, he took the one lamb that belonged to the poor guy and poor, prepared it for the one who had come to him. David, hearing the story, burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. It's unbelievable. He's, like, he's outraged. Like, how could a rich guy, he has all these animals, instead of just using one of his animals, he takes the poor guy's animal, kills it, and he prepares the food for it. That, that's disgusting. Who would ever do that? Check out verse 5. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this, what? Must die. He must pay the, for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And I'm thinking, David, you didn't have a whole lot of pity when you killed Uriah. And here it is, drum roll. Here's the confrontation. He says in verse seven, four three-letter words. David's like, that's crazy, that's outrageous. Who would ever do that? Nathan's like, you're the man. You're the man. Who's the rich guy in the story? David. Who's the poor man in the story? Uriah. Who was the lamb? Bathsheba. David, you're losing your mind over the lamb. Check it out. You did. You're the man. You are guilty. So there's going to be a consequence coming in verses 8 through 12. We don't have time to read that right now, but God sends the right person at the right time with the right message. I don't know about you. Is anybody else guilty of this? Don't leave me hanging on the stage. Sometimes, I would say most of the time, I am harder on other people's sins than I am my own sin. Anybody else here? Thank you for raising your hand. I look at other people like, get them, God. Get them. You see what they're doing? Get them, get them, get them. Hey, here's a question. Are you as angry and upset about your own sin as you are the sins of your spouse, your kids, your parents, your pastors, you fill in the blank? How, we need to put up a mirror in our own life and say, I am the problem. David, David, you get confronted in your sin. And here's the good news. We go from confrontation. Ready? Number two. By the way, let me, before I give you the second thing, let me just say this. Think about all the opportunities, the chances David had to not sleep with Uriah, not uh, sleep with uh, Bathsheba, not, he didn't do that, not kill Uriah. Think about this. All the soldiers go out to war. Remember this two, two weeks ago? So they're like, hey, David, you going with us? And he's like, no, I'm just going to hang back and watch like ESPN and stuff. There's chance number one. No, he should have said, of course, because the Bible says this is when kings go out to war. Of course I'm going. What was I thinking? I'm not staying back. Chance number one. Chance number two, when he was out on the roof checking out Bathsheba, woo, instead of like letting the emotions getting all energized, he should have said, I'm getting off the roof and I'm going back in the living room. I got to finish the second half of the game. Chance number two. Chance number three, when you called for Bathsheba and she knocked on the door, you should have opened it and said, what was I thinking? She's fine and all, but not today. And number four, when he gave the letter to the messenger to kill Uriah, he should have, as the guy walked away, he should have, no, oh, I was just kidding. Give me, bring that letter back right now. How I many know God gives us choices and opportunities all the time to not get involved in compromise and sin, and we're just like, ah, 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 ah. So number one, the confrontation. By the way, by the way, we are going to get to good news at the end. I know you came to church for good news, right? It's coming. You just got, we got one more point, okay? And it's starting to get good right here. From the confrontation, number two, the confession. The confession. So Nathan, Nathan says, you are the man. So what's David going to do about it? Lie, justify? No. Here's what he's going to do in verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against who? I've sinned against the Lord. Isn't that awesome? I think everybody in heaven's like, woohoo! He did it. He confessed. And every time you and I compromise and live a life of sin, we just got to be honest. Instead of rationalizing and justifying it, just say what David said. I've sinned against God. Notice first, 
who we sin against. Even when we yell at somebody, scream at somebody, cuss somebody out, it's ultimately a sin against who? God. He said, no, I've sinned against God. And heaven's just like, good, David, you're making a good step. How many have ever been driving in your car? You're in the car. And all of a sudden you're going down the road and this light comes on. How many have ever had that before? And I'm not, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to be mean to the ladies, but most ladies that don't, or guys that don't know much about cars, what do, what do you do? Like, I just keep driving. And let me take my glasses off. And not only do we keep driving because the light's right here, we're just like, we drive like this. I'm like, I'm just, I'm not, I know it can't, I'm not looking at it. Or, or if you want, you could get duct tape and just like, I'm sick of that thing. Every time I get in my car, I'm just going to tape over it. Or you can keep like a little hammer in the glove compartment. Every time the light comes on, poof, I'm sick of it, right? But let me, ladies, listen carefully. You could cover it up, you can hammer it. You could hide it, you could avoid it, you could not stare at it. And you can drive your car for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, maybe even six, but eventually your engine will blow. And check it out, your sin, my sin, we can justify it, we can hide it, we can cover it, or we can deal with it. You know what, we have a lot of imaginary hammers and duct tape in our life. It's like, I'm not gonna, God pointed something, I'm just gonna cover, I'm not gonna deal with it. It's going to come up. Be sure your sin will find you out. So the confrontation comes to, good, 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 David, you are, you're confessing your sin. If you don't, if I don't confess our sin, notice what this verse says, Psalm 32, 3 and 4. When I refused to confess my sin, David said, my body wasted away. There was a physical, something physical going on. Even in my body, I groaned all day long, emotionally, psychologically. Day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Listen, if you were to ask David, hey, how's it been going the last year? He would have not been saying, well, it's actually been awesome. I've just been watching Netflix and ESPN, and it's been awesome. No, he would have said the opposite. He would have said, it's been affecting my physical body, my emotions. I can't sleep at night. I've been a hypocritical husband, a miserable father, a songless worship leader, a very poor leader. Do you want to know what? People that once knew the Lord were on fire for God and are kind of living a life of compromise, do you know the Bible says this? They are the most miserable people on the planet. They might say, hey, how you doing? They're just like, awesome, man. It's so awesome. I got like three boyfriends. We party all the time. And it, they might sound like really cool. I'll tell you, when they go to bed at night, they're the most miserable people on the planet. Know about the love of God. Know about that I'm, I should be on fire for God. And they try to justify it. But if you got into the deep recess of their heart, when they're living in rebellion and compromise, I'm telling you, they're worse than a non-Christian because they know what they should be doing and they're not doing it. So David, at least he confesses and says, man, I was blowing it. What is, con what is confession? Real quickly, I've used the illustration before. I live in Camarillo. I don't. Just to illustrate. I live in Camarillo. I'm going to New Life. I get on the freeway. I'm going 101 North, and I'm supposed to get off at Rice, and I just like, I don't know. I was listening to music. I got distracted, and it took me all the way to Santa Barbara. Like, what, what have you been doing for the last, I don't know, I was just like caught up in the song, and I was, how, how many have ever like driven past where you were supposed to get off, right? So, here it is. So, so what am I doing? I was supposed to get off at Rice. So you get your car off of the off-ramp. Ready? That is confession off-ramp. I'm going in the wrong direction. Admit it. I'm, okay? Get off the off-ramp. Then what do you do? You go back over the overpass. I'll call that grace overpass. Confession off-ramp. Grace. When I confess my sin, I'm going to experience God's grace. And then what do you do? It's not enough just to get off and go over. You got to get on the freeway coming back in the right direction. That's confession and repentance. And that's restoration on ramp. I confess my sin, I experience the grace of God, and then I'm restored. And this is what David does. He confesses his sin, and God is going to eventually restore him. To, to live a life of compromise and sin, you have to admit, listen, you have to admit that you're a sinner, and what you did broke the heart of God. I'm just going to talk. Where's the ladies in our church right now? Ladies? That was really weak. We're going to give you another run at it. Where are the ladies in the church? Don't raise your hand because your husband's going to see you, but just nod if this would be true. Does your husband or fiance, does he uh, refuse to admit when he's lost when he drives? 
He's looking at, oh, you're in trouble today. You thought you were going to lure, you're going to Darwin or Schnitzel right now. I just saw, yeah, you know, so most guys don't like to admit they're lost. Get them, we're going to San Diego. Hey, honey, did you, uh, did you put it in ways or did you put it on the, I've been to San Diego a bunch of times. I don't know how to get there. Two hours later, you're like, honey, I don't see like the ocean anywhere. But I do, I just saw a sign that said, welcome to Riverside. And then you, the guy says, do I look stupid or something? Don't ever say that to your wife, by the way. Hey, you're lost. Just it, spiritually, you're, you're lost. Just admit that you're lost. Stop trying to cover it up. Stop trying to justify it. When you confess your sin, here's the awesome part. You ready for good news? This is why you came to church. Number three, cleansing. Cleansing. Here comes the cleansing. Here comes the forgiveness. Here's what we've been singing about all morning. The grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God. If I will admit, stop making excuses, stop blaming other people. If I'll just admit what I'd done, it, that it was wrong, it was sinful, I declare I have sinned against God, then I will be restored. Check this out about the love of God. Do I have any parents here? Here's what's interesting. When our kids were really small, I've used the illustration before, I, I pull into the driveway and my wife had the privilege and the honor to stay at home with our three kids. And when they got older, she would be able to work a little bit, drop them off at school, come into the office. And, uh, but when they were younger, I, I was at the office most of the time. And, and you could tell as a father, when you pull into the driveway, whether your kids and the mom had a good day together or not. And here's how you knew. You knew when you pulled in the driveway, all three kids, Daddy, how you doing? Daddy, I love you. I'm so good. Right? So it's a good day. It must have went really well with them and mom. If it was an okay day or not a very good day, maybe one kid would come out and greet you because the other two might be in trouble. Or if it was a bad day, all three kids, like, where, where are they at? And uh, then you get home, you just walk in the living room, and she's just like shaking her head. She doesn't even say it. She's like, upstairs. Sick of these kids, right? <laughs> then you go upstairs, and, and you try to... You try to get into the bedroom, right? And they put a big dresser in front of it. You can't even get in. You're like, hey, open the door. And then when you finally open the door, what, they're under the bed or in the closet because they know they're in trouble, true or false. Here's the reason. The reason is when you've offended someone, you try to avoid them. This is funny in our church. We see like young people start dating. Oh, they're so, they're sitting together like on the same chair. And then, then a couple months later, I don't know what happens, and they go to the same service, they serve together, they're just with each other all the time, and then whatever, I don't know what happens, they break up. Then it's weird. So if you date somebody in our church, and now you broke up, you don't want to see them anymore. So one goes to the 815, the other one goes to the 1230. <laughs> or one of them sits way in that corner, and the other one, it's like, oh, I saw them there. Why? Because when you've hurt one another's feelings, when you've offended one another, when you've betrayed somebody, you want to avoid them. Just... Bear with me, hypothetically. I know this doesn't happen to any marriage in this room, but just have fun. Have you ever got an argument with your spouse? You just, and then it's like 5.30, you got to go home and you pull onto the street and you're hoping that her car is not in the... Come on. Let's just, we're talking about this second service then. How many, how many know there's somebody that, right? And why? Because there's an argument. Or if they are, the car is there and you walk into the house, like they're upstairs and you're in one room and it doesn't happen in our family, but we've heard about other families in the church. You know, why? Because there's, a, there's been, because you, you hurt somebody, you want to avoid them. Here's the cool thing about God. When we sin, when we've turned our back on God, you don't have to avoid him because he's not surprised by anything. Do you think he's in heaven going, what again? You are such a loser. No, like nothing surprises him at all. So we just, we, we come clean. Here it is. Here comes the cleansing in verse 20, uh, verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan's like, awesome. The Lord's going to take away your sin. Verse 24, turn your page there, verse 24. The Bible says, then David comforted his wife Bathsheba. He went into her, he made love to her. She gave birth to a son and they named him... So David messed up, he compromised, he lived a life of sin, but God gave David another son, Solomon. Who is Solomon? He was the next king. He was, according to the Bible, the wisest person that's ever lived. He was, through Solomon, is the lineage of Jesus Christ, the Savior. Solomon wrote a couple books in the Bible. Someone just say, grace. There it is. Even in our mess up, there's grace. God says, hey, what was taken from you, I'm going to give you a son. And he was an awesome son, and he was a great king. How many are grateful for the grace and the love of God? And check it out in verse 25. 
and because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Solomon Jedidiah. It means a friend of God or loved by God. Even in your mess ups, you're still a friend of God and loved by God if you'll come clean with your sin. The most covered song in the world is a Beatles song called Yesterday. Yesterday. Check out the lyrics. All my troubles seem so far away. Now it looks as though they're here to stay. Oh, I believe in yesterday. And some of you feel like that. I, and I thought my past was like in yesterday, but it just seems like it's climbing back up on me. Oh, I believe in yesterday. Suddenly I'm not half the man I used to be. There's a... And some of you, because of your sin, because of your faults, because of your failures, there's been a shadow over your life. You want to know the difference between guilt, which is a good thing. Guilt is sin. It convicts us. Guilt says this. Ready? Guilt says you made a mistake. How many made a mistake? Okay, that's guilt. Okay, we made a mistake. Shame says you are a mistake. And some of you, you're not going forward in your life with Jesus Christ because of shame, because of yesterday. And I am here to tell you, it doesn't matter what you've done. I have heard everything under the sun. Do you know what? I'm not going to have you raise your hand, but if I were to ask a question, how many have ever murdered somebody? I, I might get one person. Don't raise your hand because just don't do it. <laughs> but I'm probably not going to get a lot. And if I were to say this, if I were to say, how many have ever murdered Christians for a living? Probably nobody in the room. And just, guess what? The Apostle Paul killed Christians before he came one. He's like, oh, I, I could never forgive myself. Well, well, God forgave Paul who killed Christians. I might, if I were to ask a question, how many have ever been a prostitute? You don't need to raise your hand, but there might be one or two, but Rahab was a prostitute used powerfully by God and went to heaven. Anybody ever betray the Lord? Well, so did Peter. You ever murdered somebody? Well, Moses did. Killed an Egyptian and buried him in the sand. So, so what have you done that's so big and so nasty that God can't forgive? Stop allowing your yesterday to get in the middle of, in the way of your destiny. Is it okay if I get to preaching right here? Here's what I wrote down in my notes. You might think you're going to get fired up. Listen, your failure is not final. Your divorce doesn't define you. You're not a mistake because you made a mistake. You might be down, but that's not your destiny. There's a second chance for your sin, your purpose, your power, your pardon in spite of your past, your problems, and people. There was healing for your heart, forgiveness for your faults, peace for your pain, freedom from your fears. There's a shepherd for your sorrow. There is deliverance from your despair. There's an answer to your anxiety, a blessing in your battle, a mer mercy for your mess ups, hope for your hang ups, a savior for your suffering, and grace for your guilt. Somebody make some noise in this place. Check it out. It doesn't matter if you had a bad day. If you've had a bad day, turn the page. If you had a bad week, turn the page. If you had a bad month, turn the page. If you had a bad marriage, a bad job, turn the page. If you had a bad life, turn the page. God's not surprised by anything. There's nothing too big. Oh, I can never forgive myself. Then you're telling me your standard for forgiveness is higher than God's. What I have done, Pastor Steve, I can't forgive myself. Well, God says, I can forgive you. He just forgave a murderer and an adulterer. And the enemy just beats us up about our yesterday. And shame is hanging over us. And it's time to get set free this morning. You and I need to be convinced of the real, authentic, genuine love of God. Let's stop singing about his love. Let's start walking in it. So we were in Washington a couple months ago. After the convention was over, we went to these falls. I don't remember the name of the falls. Awesome, beautiful. Some people parked their cars and just kind of hung out near the falls but barely see the falls. You can come over the bridge and actually get a little closer and watch the falls. You can walk down halfway down this little hill and see the falls a little better than the people that were up at top or in the parking lot. Or you could do what me and my two daughters did. We went down to the bottom. You can actually almost feel the water spraying you. It stopped, it, it's time to stop hearing about the love and the grace of God from a distance. You've seen the love of God and the grace of God from a distance. You've heard other people. We've sung songs about it. It's time to wallow. It's time to soak in the presence of Almighty God. Listen, his love is here. His forgiveness is here. His grace is here. His mercy is here to meet you where you're at. Would you stand to your feet all over the building?
So quickly, we're going to sing a song. We sang it earlier. Can I get everybody to just look right at me for a second? I really believe this is a, this is a holy moment right now. There's people in the room that you, you, you do not know Jesus personally. And this is a great, great day to get your heart right with God. Some of you used to serve the Lord, were on fire for God, and you've lived a life of compromise and sin, and today's the day to get it back. Some of you, you're actually doing really well spiritually, but so last week was all about just, I need to confess my sin, confess, confess, and some of you have done that over and over and over, but there's still a shadow of shame hanging over you. Today's the day to get set free. Today's a day for some of you just to come forward in a bit and soak in the love and the grace and the mercy of God. And I, if I could just tell you how much God loves you, for God so loved the world. I used to read that, and I'm like, well, there's 7 billion people, like, great. Then I started putting my name there. For God so loved Steve that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved Scott, and for God so loved Linda, and for God so loved Riley, and for God so loved Ashton, and for God so loved Ray, and for God so loved you. And he loves you. He's not mad at you. He's for you. He's for, can you hear me? He's for you. He doesn't love you because of your performance, what you do or don't do. He's not impressed by anything. He, he chose to put his love upon you. And there's grace and there's mercy available to you. I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what I, I need to say after that. Just some of you need to soak in the presence of God. Some of you are not Christians. You need to come forward right now and just come forward and soak in the love of God. Some of you have been living a life of compromise. You need to come forward and get your life right. Well, what are they, they going to think? Who cares what people think? Some of you just like, I, I, I've confessed certain things. I just don't feel like God really loves. No, he does. And he wants to set you free. There's one thing to be free. There's another thing to be free indeed. So I don't even know what I'm to say except that you respond to the Holy Spirit right now. We're going to fill this building right now. You need to come forward for whatever fill in the blank. I need to, I'm coming forward for between you and God. Come forward right now. Who's going to be the first one that's just going to come forward and say, I just got to do business with Jesus at the altar. Come on, who's going to come forward? Just move right now. Men and women, senior citizens, young people, African-American, Hispanic, Anglo, men, doesn't, just come forward. You and Jesus are doing business right now. Nobody's going to tell you what to say. Just come forward right now. We're going to sing about the love of God, amazing love of God. I know you love Jesus, but he wants to set you free right now. Experience his grace. Come on, get out of your seat. Stop watching other people come. You need to come forward. Right now, in the name of Jesus, you need to come forward and soak in the love of God. Let's go ahead and sing about his amazing love. It's real. It's authentic. It's the real thing. Just pray your prayer to the Lord. Ask God, what do you, what do you need from God?